everybody back to Siegel Talks here at the Martin e. Siegel Theater Center at the Graduate Center CUNY in the middle of uh, New York City and uh, in Midtown Manhattan that uh, looks still like a ghost town. It looks like every day one more store closes down and, um, and as we heard from Ann Hamburger, the producer, uh, we shall do a festival uh, in December in New York in the Meatpacking District in all the empty stores and uh, which normally is impossible to get to be done or to find some right now. It's, uh, it's very, very easy, I guess, to, um, to spot these and also talk people into using them. So today we have another day uh, of um, Corona, of the experience of uh, living through uh, this unprecedented time, also tumultuous political time with the election coming up next week. Uh, with the pandemic soaring around the world. Uh, France is considering going back into lockdown over Germany, many, many others. Numbers have never been as high in the United States. It's hitting so many areas. And um, the role of the arts and what is the meaning of the arts and what is the meaning of our lives, of course, never has been uh, more questioned. What is necessary? What is important? What has been unimportant? And we thought it was important. We are reevaluating everything. And everybody agrees this is a time of change. Change has already happened. Change will happen. And artists are the ones who are on the side of change, teaching us uh, how to uh, deal with it, how to experience it, how to find meaning, also how to anticipate it and make us comfortable with what might be coming and help us to imagine the future. And that is what theater does. It's an imagining of a possibility as people who are on the streets who demonstrate for Black Lives Matter or so others, they really imagine a different world, a different place, and they put their bodies out on the line as do theater people or the acting on stage in front or, or behind. Today we um, have uh, artists from our ongoing Prelude Festival. Since 15 years, the Siegel Center puts out a festival, the only one in New York of its kind that is free and open to the public. And it shows work in progress just from New York City artists, ensembles. It's a work from, uh, that takes the temperature of what New York artists are working on, what they are thinking about, what they're envisioning, what the imagination is taking them. And it's always been a significant, I think, contribution to the field. And perhaps uh, right now it has an additional urgency. We uh, invited uh, David Grun and uh, Miranda Harmon to, to curate it. And uh, David uh, is with us here with some of the uh, prelude artists, a few words about uh, David. David is one of the co-curators together with Miranda of the Siegel Center's Prelude Festival. He's also a dramaturg, a critic, and a doctoral candidate at Yale School of Drama where he studies a contemporary theater and performance. And um, so welcome David. And um, welcome all you uh, prelude artists who have already shown work, which still can be seen and some is upcoming. So uh, maybe we'll go around and we start with Mayen. Tell us a little bit uh, about you, a short introduction, and then we go into the discussion. Hi, everyone. Um, my name is Mayen Tio. Um, I am calling in from Williamsburg currently, um, even though my home uh, country is Singapore. And uh, I work at the intersection of artistic, civic, and contemplative practice. Thanks. Thank you. Misha. Hi, folks. It's wonderful to be here. Um, my name is Misha Chowdhury. I am based in New York, but I'm currently being a country mouse up in the Berkshires while I can. Um, I'm a director and a writer uh, and a, a a many tentacled theater maker. Um, and I'm psyched to be in conversation with all these wonderful folks today. Dominique. Hey, I'm Dominique. I'm coming to you live from Flatbush with all the Haitian energy I can serve you on a platter, um, physically in Brooklyn, but very much mentally anywhere the South is, anywhere Megan the Stallion is, you can find me. Um, I'm a director and dramaturg working at the intersections of theater, Black studies, and trans studies. Sakaria. Mm -hmm. Hi, I'm uh, Zachariah Ezer. Uh, I am a playwright, a dramaturg, and an Afro-pessimist theorist. I'm in Austin, Texas, because I am currently pursuing an MFA at the University of Texas. Thank you, thank you. So now we have those introductions who, you know, very, very short give us an impression. Of course, their real uh, introduction is their work, which can be seen or will has already been seen at Prelude. Um, 
maybe uh, we'll uh, start with, to David. David, when you and Miranda, when you put the festival together, what were you looking for? Uh, well, the theme of the festival is sites of revolution, and we were looking for work that was engaging with the idea of either a, a major change or a kind of reckoning. And, you know, our goal was really to look at as many sites as possible, not only, of course, the kind of revolutionary activity that you see playing out in the streets from the uprisings this summer uh, to various protests uh, to phone banking and other things we might understand under the rubric of politics, but also these revolutionary acts of caretaking, um, of imagination, of reckonings between families and also oneself in certain ways. So um, we felt it was important to, to open up this idea, which of course has been so closely associated with a certain kind of experimental theater, especially in the United States, and really kind of blow it open as much as possible and to create spaces where people could engage with the work. And uh, something that was important to us from the beginning was creating work that was specifically with uh, was created with the intention of being online. Of course, when the pandemic hit in March and April, a lot of people moved or adapted activities. That was very exciting and great. Um, but we wanted to create something where people were invited to, uh, specifically to make use of the website and the web and its tools from Zoom to Google Docs uh, to video games in the case of Speedrun, which is really exciting. So um, people have taken up that charge in various ways. Um, Frank, do you mind if I ask maybe Mayan to say a little bit about um, man's project uh, since it's ongoing and I think uh, as with all these other projects encapsulate some of the ways in which we've turned the website and prelude into a site where people can you know uh, have a kind of uh, those kinds of experiences. Yeah that's good may, may, may and of course what does uh, they she tell us about hold which is kind of a bookend of the festival also of the festival days. Yeah I I love the theme of sites of revolution right now right and what an offering, what an offering to be able to think about what that might be and, 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 and how to, where that actually happens. Where does revolution actually happen first? Um, I think that was the big question that I started to ask. Um, and I, I, I thought about how my body is like, the revolution has to happen in my body and in my mind before anything can happen outside that does not perpetuate the same old thing that happens. And I think um, in this time in particular, there just feels like there's a lot of screaming, like quite literally the presidential debates, the other person has to be muted when the other person is speaking. That is actually, the reality of our culture right now. Um, and, and one thing that I started to feel that I needed was um, a, a space to practice the things towards where my mind and my body can be ready for revolution. And that in itself, the practice is the revolution. Um, that's that's something that I start to come up with. So um, I, I work a lot with contemplative practice and I start to think about what can actually hold the day and hold the festival. And so I start to think about um, um, the ways in which um, what would happen if we were to sit together in the morning and in the evening. It's a practice that kept me alive during pandemic. Um, and and to be able to sort of know that people are doing that <laughs> and what it means to be in silence together in Zoom, where usually we're talking to each other, at each other, trying to do something with the time. And what happens if we stop trying to do something with the time in order to understand what's actually happening in the mind and be able to watch the mind and practice this and, and see the stories that we're spinning all the time in the mind. Um, to be able to start to understand that profoundly. So in the morning, 8.30 to 9, I offer some sort of seed of reflection. And then the idea is that the sun of the day would nurture it. And at night, we would have the rain of prayers. And so I've asked people to come. Um, part of practice, even in silence and sitting, is sangha, is community. And so I've asked uh, who I call queer holies um, to come through. And these are people who I feel like through their art have such a deep access to the divine that like when I'm there in their art, I'm like, oh, I, I see, I feel it. I'm there, you have realigned me in my spirit. 
Um, people like Diana O, people like uh, Daniel Alexander Jones really blessed us last night. Oh my God, wow. I'm, I'm still sitting. I think I have to work on that prayer for like a year. <laughs> um, and the idea is that what can come out, what can be shared after sitting in 20 minutes of silence? What has the sitting in silence prepared the animal body to receive? And what is the way in which we receive it once we do that together? Um, and how that can be a practice throughout time. So I also thought about it as preparing the body to listen to all of these incredible folks work, that there is like a way in which by doing so, we are more prepared to understand the complexities of their work, which like I know much of their, a lot of their works and I'm, I, I'm, I'm honored to be like their, my name next to these people's names. Um, the, the final sit will uh, be an hour instead of half an hour. Usually it's 8.30 to 9 in the morning and 10 to 10.30 at night. Um, and we're gonna make space, a little bit more space for people to share their experiences. Um, and yeah, so that's how it's going. Thanks for letting me speak. Great, great, thank you. Um, Misha, if we follow. Yeah. Sure, yeah. Um, yeah, I'm really resonating with um, what Mayan was saying about um, a kind of, uh, an opportunity to look inward in this moment as well as outward. Um, and yeah, the project that I've been working on and that I um, shared two installations of um, in the Prelude Festival is called uh, Vichitra, and it's a it's a project that emerged out of this moment um, specifically. Um, it was a kind of happy accident that emerged out of um, a kind of requirement to pivot um, and make work in the online space. Um, and it's specifically been an opportunity for me to um, think about the uh, sort of panoply of things that might fall under the umbrella of queer South Asian experimentation. Um, that's the, I've been calling the project uh, an experiment in queer South Asian imagination. Um, and it's an ongoing series of audiovisual experiments, um, each of which has a radically different uh, focus in terms of uh, in terms of content, um, but it's uh, an exploration in collaboration with a sound designer and a video artist and the, the project coheres really through those uh, sort of aesthetic considerations. But what's been great for me um, in, it's, it's been surprising how, uh, how much I've, um, someone asked me the other day in another context, um, what my sort of after after all of this, um, which is so much a part of the conversations that I'm having these days, there's an imagination of after all of this, which I'm not sure is precisely the sort of like right way to think about it. But I, I someone asked me how, um, what I wanted my sort of like daily life as an artist to look like after after all of this. Um, and in the moment of being, of being asked that I, uh, registered strangely that like in terms of like how I'm spending my hours on a daily basis this is actually much closer to <laughs> um, the way that I would like to be functioning as an artist um, in some ways uh, by virtue of like a lot of the uh, a lot of the sort of usual um, pulls on my time having been um, <laughs> having been cut, a lot of the strings that I'm usually tethered to having been cut um, and having the opportunity to function uh, in working in Vichitra in, partic in particular um, as uh, a kind of expansive sort of creative thinker in terms of thinking about who I get. To, I'm functioning kind of as a curator and a maker and, um, and I'm learning all kinds of new skills in the making of this piece that is really exciting. Like, um, I don't know, I'm like credited as an audio editor on the most recent um, episode. And I think that like, and for me, I think from the outset of, of launching this project, the first episode that was shown at Prelude is a, um, is a patchwork of 
uh, dreams, literal sort of uh, night dreams, dreams that folks had at night and then remembered in the morning that we solicited from uh, queer South Asian folks from all over the, uh, all over the world, um, voice memos that were recorded. Um, and then the second episode is a much more, is a single, uh, that first piece is multivocal and the second piece is, um, is my voice a piece that I narrated and wrote. Um, and it's a completely different uh, sort of sonic experience than the first one. Um, but each of those, each of those installations has um, allowed me the opportunity to um, uh, lean into a different kind of a kind of making. Um, and I've, as as David mentioned, been wanting with this project to think really actively about like what um, what it means uh, to make for this medium and learn from the folks in our universe that uh, are experts in that. And so in working with a sound designer and a video artist who work actively in the video and podcasting universes, for example, um, it's been a really, I'm like, oh, okay, we do actually consume, I think theater folks have been like, how, how do we reinvent the wheel in this moment? Um, and it's been, interesting for me to sort of like lean into um, an understanding of the fact that we already all consume um, uh, sonic and, vi and video content on a daily basis. So I'm like, what tools can I um, draw upon in um, this very particular, um, uh, in, in this sort of I don't want to say niche because that's exactly what I don't think it is. But I'm like, okay, how? What are the various, uh, uh, what are the various kinds of questions that I can ask inside of queer South Asian experimentation and imagination um, while living inside of this like 30 minute audio visual, audio driven uh, sort of visual podcast landscape. Who wants, um, sorry, who wants to go next? I mean, we'll just go at the same time, right? Uh, yeah, so uh, Speed Run is a, uh, like a short uh, theatrical-ish, film-esque piece that uh, makes use of uh, Super Mario Brothers, sort of, to talk about socialism. Essentially, like the idea came about where I'm thinking a lot about um, how Two, two thoughts. One is that uh, my experience as a leftist and a black leftist in a lot of socialist and social adjacent spaces has been uh, annoying to say the least. Uh, there is, you would, you would hope that in like far left spaces, they would have sort of a better kind of intersectional understanding. But most of the places, these places are white run organizations and have the same kind of mindset as all other white run organizations because being, let, being progressive on one valence doesn't necessarily mean you're progressive on any others. So I wanted to talk about that. And the other thought I was having was that like, um, it's a Milton Friedman thing, who I'm not a big fan of, but this is a good thought, uh, right? The idea is in a crisis, the idea is lying around. And right now socialism is an idea that's lying around very like at the fore, unfortunately not in this session's electoral politics, but it's still like kind of, you know, uh, the specter haunting uh, American politics right now. Um, and so when we do pick up this idea, as I think we inevitably will, I do want to talk about the fact that like um, black people are, you know, kind of very early like progenitors of a lot of socialist theory and they're kind of left out of the conversation a lot. And so that when we do pick up this idea that that doesn't continue to happen. Um, yeah. And then I'll let Dominique talk and then I'll maybe talk a little more about the, uh, the technical part. Yeah, and I think for another big part of it is how does, um, and this is a recent thought that you and I, I think are coming to is like, what are the what are the possibilities that slavery has made possible, right? A big theme in this play is, is this idea that um, the white folks in it have had more time to let their ideas of revolution and anger ripen into something else, right? How does slavery allow that to happen? And how does this sort of idea of socialism, which like we've had versions of in the US, right? I'm thinking about the, um, the New Deal and the way that like my grandfather and tons of other black people were just left out of these policies and the policies were made in such a way that black people could not access them, right? How does slavery enable um, 
the, the notions and ideas we have of a civil society and how do those ideas of a civil society, shout out to Frank Robertson, leave black people out, right? Absolutely. Similarly, right, like the, the long, long history of Black Union exclusion um, is very much on our minds with this. And so, yeah, we think that like, and so how we kind of take that to speedrun is that speedrun is this kind of like interestingly socialist practice kind of, which is that like individuals get like credit for speedrunning, if you don't know, beating a video game really, really fast and doing and using whatever strategies you can, maybe even breaking the game a little bit to be able to do that. It's like a community and people get credit for like achievements, but people always remember if you, if you push the, the conversation forward, the community always remembers you, like if you come up with a technique. And so we, I thought speedrun would be, a speedrunning would be a good way to explore that. And for us, the tech came into play, which is that our original idea and the play as written has a literal speed run in it but uh, where, some, where you would speed run Super Mario Brothers while the play was happening. But in traditional speed runs, they get to um, talk about like their audio, like they get to talk and like, you know, it's react to the speed run as they're doing it. So they usually don't get auto detected by YouTube's like a uh, copyright algorithm. Um, and so we were a little worried about that to be honest. So we decided to, you know, as we are all doing in this time, uh, innovate, find a new thing. So we got to engage our um, very talented designer, um, Elizaveta Kroshenko, who just looked at the scenes that we needed and when we would like cut back to the speed run and just made them um, out of, like just animated them completely. And so that was a really like nice addition to, to the piece. And I feel like it helps a little bit because the piece is so much like about Super Mario Brothers um, and, but like slightly different, being able to see Super Mario Brothers literally just be slightly different uh, is uh, I think adds to kind of the atmosphere a little bit. I have a question for uh, Zachariah and Dominique, something that struck me about your proposal was this invocation of Afro-pessimism. Of course, with Frank Wilderson's book this year, that term has gotten a lot of attention. Um, but you could you could think of a long you know you could look at Orlando Patterson as one inception point of it, and I'm sure other people have um, taken it back further. I think Dominique you mentioned Cedric Robinson, um, you know. So how does that body of work one how how might you define it briefly for people who are coming to the coming to the term for the first or you know very um, nascent time, and and how does it inform your work? Yeah. Um... Zach and I have two, I think, like two divergent paths in Afro-pessimism um, and two sort of like separate interests. Mine is rooted a lot more in um, like the anti-Blackness of gender. And so, and, and how gender as an idea and as a concept is a position uh, for the captive and not for the slave and what that means when you apply concepts of like gender to the captive body and what that does to it, right? Uh, because we think of concepts of like gender and sexuality and, and disability emerging at the same time as slavery in the US when actually it needs to be, when actually I think a better way to think about it and frame it is that slavery as an institution enabled these things to grow underneath it. Um, and so to me, for me at least, Afro-pessimism as a theory, and I think if you want to, if you want to get into it, maybe read his first book and not Afro-pessimism. There are a lot of reviews of like Afro-pessimism as a book without engaging his uh, his first text, Red, White, and Black, um, U.S. Uh, U.S. Antagonisms in the History of Cinema, or something like that. Um, and it's a theory that articulates the sort of fungibility of Black people around the world, and makes a case that slavery as an event created a split between people we recognize as humans, people who operate inside of communities and know each other, and people we recognize as slaves. And I'll slide to Zach for the follow-up. Yeah, kind of the, yeah, and the place I come in, I'm interested in it kind of in a more, uh, from a, from a class analysis and also from a like more traditional philosophy background. Um, so right, like when you think of like the enlightenment and creation of the human, the human is always defined as like, what, what is it defined as, what is it what, compared to essentially, right? Like the humans defined as free, self-determining, et cetera, right? What, so in order to know the, the limits and the domain of that freedom, you have to look at like the unfreedom who is made unfree, right? And that's like the creation of the human is also the creation of the slave as an ontological category. Like if Afro-pessimism in a nutshell to me is that like, is the ontological precondition of the world that we live in that the slave experiences violence constantly and 
for no reason other than the coherence of the world. And as such, Afro-pessimism is trying to chart what that all is, how that affects us, and luckily uh, us as in uh, Black people, uh, and how, what we can do about it. Um, and really the best answer we have is to end the world as we know it and do something new. And that luckily, there's a, there's a nice generation uh, after the uh, Wilderson generation uh, of the original Afro-pessimists who are starting to do some of that work. Um, and especially a lot of um, women and non-binary folks who are especially doing that work on gender, which is great. I mean, it's interesting. Um, on one hand, it's something very personal, um, dreams, uh, meditation that looks inside. On the other hand, your work um, um, of speedrun looks at structures and uh, over centuries and, si and systematic repression, you know, they're like two poles. What do you guys think? What is the, the role of the artist at the moment, uh, that, that, that uh, unprecedented moment that we experience right now? What, what, what can art do? I mean, I'm so excited by what y'all are saying. And I'm always thinking about these structures and forms that have been imposed along the way that we just accept as true, right? So I'm thinking about how um, uh, Freud, right? <laughs> if you look at the id, the superego, that's actually a construction of our psyche that places one in dominance of another. And that that in itself will help us, will, will encourage us, if we think of our psyche that way, we are just going to replicate that same structure outside of ourselves in our society continually. And um, the, the scholar that, that brought that up, I remember like at being at a conference and hearing this paper, and she was basically saying like, we have to go to Fanon. We actually have to go to Fanon who, you're right, it's like, like we actually have to like, couldn't like tear this <laughs> we have to stop the thing <laughs> we actually have to do so i mean artists you know if you're asking like what artists have to do like we it's our power of imagination we also we kind of have to imagine ourselves out of this right in or imagine ourselves into the destruction in which we can survive like yes to destroying the system and then how do we survive beyond the system um in in or, or who should survive beyond the system or how like what what who will uphold the systems or what the, how are the systems upheld and you know like i remember i i was um um uh, at another call where diana milosevic uh, from the da theater of belgrade was talking and and i i i remember what she said she was like we have to outlast them that's our job is resilience we have to outlast it you know so it's both like i don't know i'm thinking about how artists we both have to figure out how to outlast it um and also like how to imagine i feel like dominique you're like so excited you want to speak oh my god i want to hear what you have to say <laughs> oh yeah um i was just gonna say i think and this is not to, to the question it's just something that you said that it always makes me think about it is like the, the the actual reality is right like the state is not keeping us safe and there are people who are surviving without it right now, right? Like abolition as an idea is a thing that is already present in communities. What do you do when the cops don't come to your neighborhood, right? Like what do you and the people around you do when the cops ignore you? What do you do when the only time the government like recognizes you as a person is when it's time for you to cast a ballot that is going to get a bomb dropped on someone, right? Like what do you do in those in that other time and like the, the the thing that you're talking about is already existing how do we continue to lean into it and i think more importantly is like how do we convince um the people in power that like the thing they should be right is abolitionist and that this state thing isn't serving anyone and that maybe we can do something else and i just want to thank you for bringing that up man yeah but how do you how do you get people to like like divest from the thing that serves them or they think it serves them. I think that's our. I think that's what our job is, which is that I think you were right on there with political imagination. Which is that I think that like when we're doing our best work, it's like it's it's like agitprop. Is like we are putting like these like new ideas into the world. We're like shifting the like Overton window so that like I mean you know, ten months ago abolition was like prison abolition was like 
um, among ra non-radical circles a joke, right? They're like, oh yeah, sure, what are we gonna do with all the murders and rapists? And everyone would just say that and that would be the end of the discussion, right? Like now we're actually able to have a conversation because we like, because various things have happened to shift the Overton window left. And that's, what, that's what we do. We make sure that like when, when events happen, the ideas lying around are our ideas so that they get, they're the ones that get picked up. Um, and so I think injecting like, you know, the, the best thoughts we have into, into discourse is, is, is what our job is. And recognizing what the things are too. Like, I feel like, uh, I feel like it's part of us being able, like, I think our job is also to be able to see it <laughs> and name it <laughs> and be like, this is actually what's going on. <laughs> We've been duped to think that this is blank, but really this is blank. And how are we not feeding into it again and again and again, right? That's what I'm always thinking. I think about how, um, I think about trauma porn, right? on stage. And I think about how like that discourse of it or um, the the way I see myself as an Asian femme depicted and like what what that is in terms of like uh, uh, how 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 um, deeply I want uh, uh, Asian performers to be hired. And yet the only thing they get to do are that which is within the white imagination like continually, always, <laughs> even like all the time. Um, and I think about like, like how, how much more do I have to be complicit, to gain enough power to change it? And by that time, will I have been complicit long enough that I am too tied to my success? Absolutely. I think that, yeah, I'm to reference, uh, Jimmy brought up earlier, the, uh, the, the first Wilderson book with, with specifically with, uh, black bodies, the way that they were most often early seen on film was just in recordings of lynchings. So it's just sort of like, yeah, they're these, like, they're these ways that like the, we, we do have to change what the, the, the thing is used for. And it is one of those things where it's like, what, at what level can we engage with the thing without, uh, and change the thing without being changed? And that is definitely like, I feel like our eternal struggle. Um, <clears throat> last question. Um, it sounded like, you know, speed round, you guys all of a sudden are creating video games. Um, Misha says, I'm credited as a sound editor for the first time. Mayan, in a way, you are a curator for your series, you know, which is a, a long um, a durational um, site performance in a way. Do you feel it's, is, this is a moment where everybody does something they haven't done before? And, um, and how does that uh, affect the, the, the work? Well, I've never done this before. It is something I do, right? So mm -hmm. like, I've never done hold before per se, but mm -hmm. it is something I do. I feel like, um, I feel like this is actually a, a practice and a community that has emerged from my life. And, um, you know, I, I like how you say like curator of a series. And I'm like, is that what I did? I thought I was making a community. Mm -hmm. I thought I was asking my elders mm -hmm. and my friends who I needed to pray for me to pray for us. Mm -hmm. Oh, I guess that's also a creator of a series. <laughs> but but the the change of language and the frame upon it um, uh, for me helped me contextualize performance as a site of healing and as a site of gathering in a way that requires participation of doing nothing. And like, so, so I guess, I guess for me, like, yeah, I'm doing something new and not, and not, and what, what that means to me is um, like thinking about emergence and thinking about um, the next step being that which has required everything before and to go about something in a way that, um, and these are principles that I've always had, right? The principle of like, I will do it in a way that no matter what happens, it was worth it. 
So with each of the people that I curated, I sat with them for half an hour, we meditated together and then we talked and we caught up. And it was this building of something that is underneath that, that didn't get shown, <laughs> but it was there, it was underneath it. Um, and so I think it, it it, to, to me, it's like, yes to, yes to the new, but, but coming from a lifetime of practice. Mm. Is Corona changing the way you work? That's the question. Short term, but long term also. <clears throat> this isn't really a, I'm just sort of like, I've been, I'm sitting and listening and I don't know precisely what question I'm responding to, um, but I I think that I'm this. I think that in this moment, um, I find myself in a place of sort of many different valences of uncertainty. I feel like, and that that like lack of certainty and surety. Um, I think that I've often talked about my sort of relationship to my work as an artist as I think it's been like a good thesis statement for me in the past to like want to move into my work from a place of um, having not yet figured out what the like what the upshot of what I'm making will be. Um, but I feel that in this moment um, more than ever like um, the idea that I am sort of moving into uh, making and creating from like uh, like a deeply ambivalent place or an uncertain place inside of myself in terms of like the, how shall I say it? Like in terms of the capacity or scope or like, uh, um, in terms of what my work like is meant to or can do, um, I think that in the in I've there's a kind of like man you mentioned ego and id and Freud and I think I've been spending a lot of time this year just sort of like reflecting on um, in some ways the arrogance with which I've approached uh, my my um, relationship to my work in the past. Um, and I don't know if arrogance is quite the right word, but maybe just sort of like the ego with which I, by virtue of like the ways in which we are required to sell ourselves in, uh, in the field and in the industry in order to create in terms of like uh, artist statement defying ourselves and mission statement defying ourselves and branding ourselves in particular ways. I think there's a kind of um, like, uh, language around like the sort of like prefigurative attempt of my work that I have developed um, over my life as an artist that is like this work will do this um, that I find has fallen um, sort of disconcertingly but also usefully away um, in the last a uh, few months in the sense that I'm like, I don't quite, um, you're asking what is the role of an artist and I can only speak for myself, but I don't like, I don't really know right now in um, for myself um, how to answer that question in a like, from a place of like, um, like I can imagine, and I'm so sort of like inspired to, to be listening to all three of you in terms of the ways that you're thinking about this moment. And I've always, um, I've also always been really attracted to um, like, I, I also um, am, 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 am drawn toward the sort of like, the, the strands of, uh, of theory that move us towards um, that recognition of like the fact that the, um, I often think about like 
this article by Stephanie Smallwood that has that always like that blew my mind when I first read it in terms of thinking about the fact that like uh, that instead of thinking about um, like the relationship between um, freedom and slavery as being like a um, how does she put it but like the way in which we think about like uh, slavery in the new world having given rise to uh, having given a sort of material injection to the possibility of like enlightenment and rights-based thinking in the in 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 um, in oh. Europe the fact that like in fact um, it was slavery itself that like uh, that wage labor emerges out of uh, like the idea of the owned body um, and that kind of like I, I'm in I'm super inspired by listening to uh, the two of you talk about your relationship to Afro pessimism that you're um, expressing so articulately and I yeah I'm just sort of like sitting here in a place of like uh, like useful confusion I think the like last I, you're talking about like what how has Corona changed my uh, relationship to making and it, it has I think sort of like disoriented me like totally in a way that not it has disoriented me totally but like the tethers of like uh, Mayanne you were talking about like uh, if I participate in it enough it, how how wedded to uh, the structures of the industry do I become and I feel like having those sort of marionette strings snipped in some ways over the course of the last um, eight to 10 months, I find myself like having to, uh, in terms of reckoning, right? I find myself having to sort of like re-ask myself all kinds of questions that had become, like the things that had meant the most to me had become uh, sound bites and like ways of selling myself, like my most sort of cherished uh, political values had become useful, um, uh, like useful language by which to sort of reinvest myself in, um, in a particular kind of relationship with theaters and institutions. Yeah. 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 Thank you. I'm curious on the question of your relationship between theater and institutions this is for everyone. Um, what do you want to see from the field? And you know, what, what have you seen from the field that has been inspiring? I'll just say briefly for Miranda and I, you know, we've often talked about what Soho Rep is doing in terms of bringing artists on the payroll. Um, there's been parts of me that have thought we should just turn the entire nonprofit theater industry into one large mutual aid sector, just liquidate the assets, you know, turn it into healthcare and everything else. Um, and that one, runs along a long line. I mean, that very vague idea for me is, is probably the product of many, many years of thinking about abolition within the context of arts and culture. And, you know, uh, you can, you can think off of Fred Moten and Stefano Harney's critique in the university and their comments that, you know, the university is the privatization of what should be shared. Um, I'm, that's a very simplistic um, version of their thesis, but I'm curious, you know, just, just I, however, um, earthy or theoretical this wants to be for you. Uh, what do you want to see from the field and maybe specifically those institutions who claim and in some cases do serve artists such as yourselves? Yeah, I think about, I've been thinking about this question a lot and I think that it really hit a head for me in the, in, in May. Um, it was just like that straight week where like black people were dying, which is not different from any other week, but where it seemed like there was a lot of attention being given to it. And I think a big thing that I was watching was this conversation that was happening about um, policing and the way that like the, like the way that police function, right? And the, the call, the necessity of the call for abolition as an end to like policing in the police state. And the thing that I think started to unravel for me and, and Zach and I have talked about this a lot is that like the, the same police that are prowling the streets are the same police that are sitting um, on theaters boards and are running institutions, right? That the, the, the way that policing works um, is, is a deep practice that so many of us have internalized that black people and, and, I, and also people of color to a larger extent are like, 
policed in these institutions, right? That our ideas, our bodies, the way we make, the way we think about making, the way we engage with like what Man was talking about earlier, right? Like this, this idea of trauma porn. Um, Sadia Hartman reminds us that like the, the black pain does not arrest the reader. It does not incite a crisis, right? So what does that mean? What are these stories doing? What are they, are they changing things? Are, or are they in a line, in a tradition of work that like, you know, leads us nowhere? And so I think for me, one of the big ones is like we, in many, I'd like to see an ending to the policing inside of these institutions, um, which might be, which might be in a roundabout way and, and asked to end institutions. I'm not really sure. I also think that like for a lot of um, white institutions specifically, how are resources being moved and how are they being moved around to support, I think explicitly here, like black theaters, Asian theaters, Latinx theaters, right? Like how, how are we thinking about who we are supporting and who gets that support on a state level, on a donor level? And, and one big one for me is like, I'd just like to see more money going towards um, hashtag defund white theaters maybe. Um, I'd like to see more money going towards theaters of color who are doing the work that we need to be doing all the time, right? Without, without like any fanfare, without having to make a big press release about it. How do we support those institutions, both as artists and like thinking about this large, like in a large scale way, how do we make sure that those institutions are supported and taken care of? Is like, I think um, my two sort of like industry-wide thoughts, also unions. I feel like arts administrators need unions. Um, because they'd be working 60 hours a week and they're supposed to be working like 40 and 60 is low. 60 is a low ball number for like how much work arts administrators do. I think a, an arts admin union would be very, very helpful. Right, second to that, and I'm like very much, right, really like kind of workers cooperative about it, which is that like, I think that functions of hierarchy in a lot of these organizations are what allow the policing to occur. Um, I mean, there's larger, right, like societal and like libidinal economy issues, but I think that like we would, it would be a huge step for it to be, right, like we, theater, like everyone gets who works in theater, it's not necessarily like another industry where you, you don't maybe like um, become the marketing exec for an airplane parts company because you love airplane parts, but you, but everyone in a theater loves theater, you don't, why else would you, you know, you know, take the honestly like low pay compared to like other industries. Like half the people in theater are like people who are theater people who can never do not do anything else, uh, which is, and I'm certainly one. Um, but the other half of them are like marketing and, and development execs who are just like, who love theater and will, and will love it so much they'll take less money. The fact that they don't get to, you know, vote on like the things that matter to them in the institution and they just have to like market or develop for whatever, right? Like the, the, the essentially the CEO of the nonprofit says they have to do is, um, you know, a little ridiculous. Also, especially the way that like um, people of color at, at a lot of institutions are kept out of artistic departments means that they don't get to decide either. So like if they, so if a person of color who's like super interested in theater finally gets to work at a place they wanna work, it's ra rarely in a decision-making place. So yeah, like my like big thing that I would love to see is that if we only changed one thing, I think we should change a million more things than one, but it is to sort of like in these institutions, like democratize and like kind of flatten the hierarchy so that, that everyone can get a say in like making this thing that we all obviously care about, otherwise we wouldn't be here. Yeah, so maybe maybe we can get a, a, a big closer to also David's original question. What are you guys uh, working on also at the moment? And now after your prelude, what is on your mind? What is what is your imagination? What is your vision about you? the piece? Of course, we show excerpts, but what are you all thinking about? What you're working on? What would you like to do? Which perhaps you couldn't, but what is on your minds as projects? Again, I think I'm just, um, I can speak to, I think I've turned to a sort of, I'm thinking kind of granularly about like, it's been, uh, it's been useful for me to have the opportunity in making these episodes of this project, which is sort of what is on the horizon for me by virtue of having like made 
<laughs> made this ongoing series. I'm like, oh, everything that I make falls under the umbrella of this series now, which is nice. I'm like, cool, anything is anything I make is the queer South Asian imagination. So uh, that is going to be <laughs> the next episode of the project. Um, but I'm working, the fourth episode is um, that's coming out in December is a collaboration with um, some queer Carnatic uh, musicians. Um, and it's been really like, I don't know, there, again, I'm sort of like uh, feeling a kind of, it's been really wonderful. Also, I wanna shout out Cameron Neal and Jeremy Bloom, who are the core collaborators on Vichitra, who I didn't mention earlier. I just, um, they are the video artist and sound designer that um, I was speaking of in the abstract. But it's been really wonderful just to sort of like lean into these unusual collaborations that I might not have had the opportunity to. And really, I mean, to be frank, like what I'm making is not theater right now. Um, it is happening in the context of uh, like, it is happening, it is being commissioned by theaters because theaters are who I know. <laughs> um, but it's like, it is, they are visual podcasts, they're short films, they're not, um, I think that there's a useful sort of collapsing of those boundaries that has been helpful for me because I feel like I've always been that person in like theater rooms when the question is asked like, there's where, when there's a sort of preciousness around what theater is, I'm always like, is it, is it as like distinct as we imagine it to be from these other forms? Um, but um, yeah, so I'm working, so I'm like doing a thing that I never would have had the opportunity to do, which is just sort of like kind of uh, like sitting in conversation with um, Carnatic classical musicians and like developing a new sort of like half an hour long composition um, based on these sort of seventh century, eighth century, ninth century texts um, uh, about like, um, there's this woman in the, there's this legendary figure in, um, uh, in Carnatic music um, and in the South Indian tradition named Avayar, who is a young girl who like uh, asks to be, re asks to be transformed into an old woman um, in order to, she's like, all I want in life is to be an old woman so I can just bypass the whole like having to get married and having to like have a man in my life thing. Um, and she's this like little, so she's this sort of like um, kind of deliciously childlike figure in an old woman's body. And also there's a like, can I become an old woman in order to uh, like desire the God? Like there's a like the, the God that she, um, Murugan, who in the South Indian tradition is usually portrayed as a young, like a young boy. She's like, I want to become an old woman so I can be this sort of maternal wise figure and like love the God from a like motherly place. So that project is just an opportunity. I'm working with Rupa Mahadevan and Shiv Subramaniam and we're just like, um, it's like, you know, it's like we're making new music. That's, that's, what, the, that's what the piece is. Um, new compositions based on these old texts and they're all about these sort of yearnings for different kinds of transformations. So like an old, uh, like these various uh, writers in the Granatic tradition who are like, I would become, I yearn to become like uh, a step in the temple like stairway leading up to the temple rather than being one of the devotees i want to be a step in the in the temple so that i can like look directly up into the mouth of the god or um so we're just like looking at these various different kinds of transformations and it's been super fun to lean into that kind of like granular thinking um just kind of like okay i want to deal with this very tiny piece of text this very tiny story um, and see what it has to offer up to me in this moment. Mm -hmm. I'm doing a lot of sleeping, a lot of a lot of sleeping these days, which I don't feel like I got to do a lot of in the before times, which is great. Mm -hmm. um, melatonin is so nice. <laughs> um, waking up at like 10 a.m. with like without knowing that there probably isn't going to be a rehearsal today is like 
freeing. I, I don't feel like we talk a lot about like the labor of being a director, um, which is something I know I learned in part from watching Mayan. Um, I, I have never seen someone so busy. <laughs> Um, and, and so for me, one of the sort of big, the big first things I decided to do was like, what, what if I just pull everything back and like, I actually just go to bed more and I enjoy my room more. Um, and so for me, I, I think like sleeping has become a big part of my practice and a big part of my life in a way that it wasn't. And also just like being able to walk around my neighborhood at times that aren't like 10 PM at night because I'm coming home from like a work day. Uh, it, it, it feels like for me, it's less in this moment making art or like thinking about art as much, but really just taking the time to check in with like Dominique without any sort of relation to um, the labor that I would usually be doing right now, which has been very, I feel really, really nice about. I think that's a maybe a joy of being a freelancer right now. Um, and so when projects do come, um, it's like, oh, I can actually focus on making this mixtape with Diane Xavier, which I'm gonna love doing in February, right? It's like being able to like act like, oh, Zach wants to do this thing for Prelude. Yeah, I ain't doing stuff right now. Let's do it. Let's make like a video game and see what happens with it, right? Um, the, the lack of like normal everyday structure that I think I was relying on before has, a, has really freed me up to do other things. Um, which are both like other things more personally and just like reading again. I love being back to like just reading Scenes of Subjugation by Celia Hartman and being like, oh, I'm still not done with the work, right? And just sort of that kind of thing right now. Right, definitely want to second that. Uh, I feel very like, um, will I quote the Communist Manifesto twice? Yes, I will. Um, like, you know, I get to like uh, work a little bit in the morning. I get to, you know, you know, proverbially because uh, go fish in the afternoon and then like read a little bit at night. I get to kind of like, my life balance is better. Um, and also like Dominique uses the word refusal a lot to talk about this, where it's just sort of like, no, I will not engage with the machine right now because honestly, I'm at my house and you can't, it, you can't get me. Um, and that's pretty great. And for me, what that is, is like working as an early career playwright, I feel, I feel, I, part of it is that I'm in school, part of it is also just that like, this time is made, like, I'm free from the like, you must write one play a year, and then you will put it, you will give it to everyone who could possibly care about it, and hopefully one of them will care, and that will like, move you around, up, and now, now I'm writing weird Afro-pessimistic experiments, uh, and Dominique, uh, you know, I, I'll call Dominique when I finish one, and I'm like, this one doesn't make sense yet, help me make it make sense, uh, and then we'll, we'll do something with it. Um, so yeah, now speedrun is, Actually, it's part of a collection of our pessimist experiments that I'm working on actually before the pandemic, but the pan like has really like made me care about that way more than anything else I'm working on. So uh, we got three and there's gonna be a fourth one. They will be somewhere sometime when we feel like it and then they will all be done. And then they will once again be somewhere sometime. Um, a lot of my creative practice is actually as a director, dramaturg, and so um, I, I'm in multiple processes right now, doing work about Hong Kong protests, uh, doing uh, work about Chinese American history. Um, um, Little Shop of Horrors is a live puppet film, gender queered. That's another thing that I'm up to, um, and um, like uh, there's there's a lot going on as a director. And I asked, doing this was phenomenal for me because it rooted me in a practice of making space um, that's coming from my body, right? And so I'm so grateful to David and Miranda for including me in this. And people have actually talked about like, can we continue? Like what, like, does it stop with Prelude? Can, can we continue? Can we support? Can we figure out a community that will continue to do this in some way, shape or form that's not just on, on my body, but that we gather. And so that's a beautiful thing that's about to happen. Um, and I'm also obsessed with um, doing new things that really terrify me. Um, uh, as an artistic director of Musical Theater Factory, I have access to like the most phenomenal singers in the world. And I've been asked to do um, a piece and make a make a text, make, make something from a line from a John Lewis speech. And then they put it all together of all of these artists. And I've decided that I should write the song and sing the song, um, which is not something I do, but I must because it terrifies me. So I am involving people to help me out, but I'm like, I could really ask these 10 phenomenal like 
people on, you know, every like to sing this, but no, I must put my voice out there in some way, shape or form. So I'm continuing to force myself to do things that scare me, um, like learn garage band, what, whatever. And I also am going to make an app. I'm putting it out there. I'm saying it because then I'm like, have to do it. And the, the app is called Zen master and it will pull you through the different ways, um, and contain syncretic wisdom in which you can opt into what you need. <laughs> like I'm feeling like an imposter and then you press it and then like different game-like structures will pop up so that it guides you through that particular thing that you're feeling into koans and parables from all the different places, crowdsourced so that people can also like offer that. So that's the app that I'm working on. There we go. <laughs> Incredible. David, do you have another question? Um, if not, I would say, what as a closing question, what inspires you at the moment? Who do you follow? What do you read? What do you listen to in music uh, or other shows you see online? What 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 uh, keeps you? What is is there something that you look up to at the moment? What do you do? This is a quick sort of. Uh... This is just like, I just wanted to, I was like, oh, I should definitely mention that the the third episode of <laughs> Vichitra is currently running at Ars Nova, not as a sort of like, um, I was like, it, it it started yesterday and it was a collaboration between my partner, Cameron Neal and I, and I just would have been remiss if I didn't say it. Um, it's a series of conversations uh, with, uh, it's a, it, the the frame of the piece is my partner and I, I'm trying to situate our interracial relationship in a larger constellation of Black and South Asian encounters. Um, and I guess what has been inspiring to me is like having these like interviews with folks from, I feel like I, because, I, because I've become an interviewer in the process of making this piece, um, having conversations with folks um, that I usually wouldn't have time to have conversations with has been really, um, remarkable and inspiring sitting and listening to someone I've known my whole life, uh, 84 year old woman talk about like, oh, the first time I ever saw a black person was when I was eight years old during World War II in like Eastern India when like black American soldiers drove trucks through our town and threw Butterfinger chocolates at us. And I'm like, you were alive during World War II, like not a thing that I <laughs> ever would have had the opportunity to hear from, from you, so. Yeah, that's having conversations with people has been inspiring to me. I'm I'm with Misha and I think it's um I'm feeling um the possibility of being hyper present with the things that are actually happening inside me and with me. Um, um I I held a a baby, a ten month old baby. I'm I'm not desiring to be a parent. I've never I've never really had the clock is not there. Like it's not even on the shelf. It's not there. Um, and I held this baby. And after that, I was like, oh, this is so sweet, so cute. Oh, here we are. And then I left the house and I started to cry. Like it, it just, it just started to overwhelm. Like it was such a powerful experience. And I started to like ask myself, like, why am I responding this way? And I realized that, that it is the, the only moment of touch I've had in such a long time that was so uncomplicated and filled with like pure joy and that I, I did not need to be in any way defensive and, and um, I did not need protection. Um, instead it was the other way around. Um, so I'm really sitting with, with um, experience right now. I um I reading or inspired. I there are two sources for me right now. The first is Netflix finally putting black sitcoms on Netflix. And so it's just me watching half and half and uh, one on one and the Parkers and Moesha and just having like going back to a part of my childhood that like a lot of people just a lot of people a lot of non black people I think oftentimes just aren't privy to um and so it's been great to sort of like have that moment and then I built a um sort of core curriculum for myself with um readings I'm trying to read all of 
Sadia Hartman's canon uh, before next year, which is to say like the first pass of a lot of things, finally finishing scenes. Um, and I'm reading this other book called Becoming Human, uh, Matter and Meaning in an Anti-Black World by Zakia Amon Jackson. So it's a lot of, uh, it's a lot of returning to readings I've been putting off, a lot of like finally having the chance to like watch panels, which is great. Cause like I can just watch Sadia Hartman do a panel now, which is fucking amazing. She has New Yorker articles, which is great. Um, and it's just sort of like finally being able to follow the theorists and thinkers whose books have been so important to me in real time, because now they are, I think, um, in the middle of doing their projects more free to speak and like do things like this. So that's been really inspirational. Also, just like what May Ann just said really messed me up with the baby. That was, that's going on my list now. <laughs> so thank you for that, May Ann. <laughs> right. Yeah. Like, Austin, Texas babies. I'm gonna, I'm gonna find one of you. I think. Um, uh, but yeah, no, I definitely agree with Dominique. I'm doing a lot of, uh, you know, the, the theoretical reading uh, situation. Um, I'm kind of working my way through a lot of the foundational texts of Afro pessimism, uh, either visiting or revisiting. Uh, so that's like the early Wilderson and Hartman, who are the two co-founders of the discipline, uh, and reading honestly. And I'm, I'm doing a lot of like television studies stuff right after school. And the thing that has really struck me is that like. One thing that like they did a lot and maybe it was a cheap ploy then, but I oh, guess me every time is that like truly they seem to have found the most adorable black kids to be the first black kids on TV. So there's like the, the first uh, the first uh, like non stereotyped black show, the show called Julia and the son in that is so adorable. And so I'm just watching all of Julia because they just like put the camera on him for like maybe five minutes at a time and just watch him play. And I'm just like, I'm just crying. Um, and so that's that's just great stuff. Um, and then also, whenever anyone's asking what my inspirations are, I must must always uh, plug um, Alicia Harris. She is the greatest living playwright. And find anything you can by her uh, on the internet and pay her money for it because uh, it's all good. Amazing, David. Any thoughts? No, this has been fantastic. It's, a, it's you know, a real privilege and honor to have all of you involved with the festival. I just also want to thank, you know, uh, Miranda Heyman, the co-curator, along with our incredible producing team, Sammy Morreale, Lucy Pallas, uh, Sammy Pine, you know, our graphic designer, Lena Mitchell, our website developer, uh, Lorena Ramirez-Lopez, um, Harry, our stage manager. So there's a really great team and um, Andy Lerner from the Siegel Center as well. So there's a really great team behind me. I'm just the representative because everyone else is making the festival run and work and I get to spend this time with all of you, which I'm really grateful, but I am just a mere emanation of um, this larger ensemble. So, um, and you know, thank you all for joining us. It's been so great. And people check out the work. Also, I wanna make a plug. I did this yesterday. I'm gonna do it every day. Please listen and watch the work with real speakers. Don't use your little Mac internal speaker. Make sure you can hear the sound because it's so beautiful, not only for, you know, quote unquote sound pieces uh, like Misha's, but everything, even the silence in man, you really need, you know, that dynamic. So, um, and check out uh, all these works on uh, prelude nyc 2020.com. Yeah, that's important. Also work that already has been shown is still there. It's archived. Some of it you can still uh, re, re experience even so they are released over time. It's uh, quite uh, interesting. It's like a little Netflix series for, um, for the New York downtown theater, I see it, but just in a completely different and new, way and form. We have never done this as incredible um, uh, how much shape this festival took and I think it is truly um, and, and something to notice and to think about and uh, helps us to create to create meaning. So we're going to have uh, throughout the week uh, more talks with uh, the Prelude artists and also a moment to listen what New York artists are thinking about. Also significant New York artists, emerging artists, and more artists truly from all the communities and um, we have to listen very closely and uh, to these ideas about also what Kelsey talked about it yesterday, like Mayan about healing and, you know, and Dominic and Zach about the structures, the system that isn't um, and really working and, you know, the work of Misha and his communities, how do you bridge South Asian and American and African, I mean, how do you, how do you really deal with it? How do you put it together? And what do you produce these dreams he, he records of people? And um, so this is something we all should be thinking about and how could it um, uh, reflect or maybe implement this in, in our lives. So really thank you all for uh, listening. Thanks for HowlRound um, um, to keep us uh, on their great uh, um, uh, digital platform. So I hope you all will stay safe and tune in again tomorrow. Thank you all for participating and all of you guys again, thank you for taking the time. 
and energy to be with us and to participate in this really uh, inspiring Prelude Festival that asks a lot of questions. It's not explaining anything, but it's exploring. And that is important. So thank you all. Thank you. Bye-bye. Thank you. Thanks for having us. Yes. Bye-bye.